This is his regular seat. Ah, Epelembe. And that's where it all starts. Then we get down, we sit together, and take the saxophone, start playing around with it until the family, or if, well, uh, I, until I successfully get across to him, then we start singing. Okay. I met Uncle Tunji in the late 60s. We had formed a schoolboy band while I was in primary school. So we always looked around for an avenue, sort of, to be able to showcase what we had. Eventually, we discovered Kongi Club. We got there, asked the manager if we could play, even if we had to play, had to pay to, to, to perform. So he introduced us to Tunji Ilano, that we could be awarded maybe five minutes or so during their break time. And that's how I met him. After the first performance, we were about to leave. I noticed Uncle Tunji, as we call him, approached me to ask if we were coming the following Sunday. He said, ah, did we do so well? He said, no, please come. <laughs> he said, he'll uh, encourage us, he'll teach us what we don't know. And I found myself not only playing during the five minutes uh, breaks, but during Uncle Tunji's programs too. He would ask me to come on and play the guitar, take a solo. Sometimes the to me, the solos were lousy, but he would clap and encourage. And the, the crowd always encouraged, probably because I was small and tiny. He has composed virtually uh, at least 50% uh, of all my, um, the plays I use in my, in my uh, the songs I use in my plays. We, you know, we work together very, very, very well. You know. So that kind of music is not what you call commercial music. In the 70s, when I was in the university, we used to listen to his music, popular music like Bobo Batolo or Lakowe. You know, it moved you. You know, you had to go to Kokodom to spend a lot of money to listen to music and enjoy yourself. And when there's no more money, you resort to Guguru Perere. So, Papa is a, is a genius. <laughs> One of the things which actually was remarkable about Tunji was that I found he was very deep into Yoruba culture, Yoruba music, 
which naturally, you know, uh, flowed into the kind of sketches we were doing. Because it wasn't just socio-political sketches. We were actually using that uh, indigenous cultural material uh, for infusion even into uh, the mainline uh, drama. So he was he naturally fitted into, into that kind of a schema of a, a culture saturated drama. He got to know about my talents. That I could sing, I could play the organ, I could uh, play drums, I could even, you know, uh, engage myself in a, in a very funny uh, comic dialogues with him. So he thought maybe I could be a good actor too. That was how the man decided that I should be a young member of the Nazi 60 Masters, apart from being a secretary. He was giving people like me uh, little roles to play in the productions, in drama productions of the 60 Masks. There was one um, composition of his, Allah Ruto Njebredi. I went visiting. Usually in the evenings, I would just take a stroll to Adamasi by his house, walk in. So I saw him at the dining table. He was um, fidgeting around with the organ. So he said, I should come in. He sang a tune to me. I said, I should play it. So I played it. He said, yes, that's exactly what, it, what he wanted. I should rehearse it properly. I could even with it. I wonder what it was. It, it didn't sound very... I mean, good to me. It didn't sound sweet at all. It was like sour sweet. Then, he, after a while, I uh, played it so well. He, he, he called in the guitarist and he sang into it. And that was Allah Ruto Jebredi. Nigeria is well talented, it's blessed by God in many ways. Talk of people's brains, talk of their energy, talk of their you know, uh, uh, ability to move things. We have them in Nigeria more than enough to run the country well. But somehow, in our political life, wrong people get into the, into the uh, parliament, into the senate, and so they loot the nation senselessly and, 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 and without the fear of God. That's a shame. I pray that there be a time when the younger Nigerians will know what to do with their country. I was fortunate to be one of those who was present when MK was established. That was 2003. And since then, I've been a kind of a permanent fisher in this restaurant. And he has been like a father to me, personally. He has encouraged me. He's someone that is so warm and um, all the qualities that you'll be looking at on TV in Nigeria, everything came out to bear. He doesn't treat me like a worker. Um, I won't say he treats me like, um, like a son. Sometimes I will say he treats me like, um, like a friend, a colleague or a brother. Because the way he talks to me, you wouldn't expect an adult to talk to you like that. He's a truly Yoruba leader. He believes in our culture and all can be seen in his character. It's 
one of the nicest, most disciplined person I ever met. He looks after everybody. He is so interested in what you do, when you do it, and how you do it. In those days, when we used to go to performances, parties, paid for parties, Uncle Tuju would pay everybody at the end of the program, only to discover that he didn't even have enough money left to pay for transport to get back to Ibadan. <laughs> we now call me back to the end that ah Angela, she bought five hundred naira. Hello, where? Cafes are transport. Ah, we we are carrying all the money. You shared everything out. <laughs> I remember he would drive to my house in Okiadu and sit down there for hours. At about one o'clock, he would drive off and bring this slim, tall, young lady and say, well, that's my wife. And they would usually come to my house and she was such a nice person with him. She kind of understood him on the spot. I'm talking about Kike, Kike Lomo, his current wife, personal nurse, and mother. I was a student in UI, and then one day, a cousin of mine sent me to the senior staff club to deliver a message for somebody. And when I got there, the person I was sent to wasn't there. And I lingered a little bit, and then decided to leave. And as I was going, coming out of the staff club, I met Tunji uh, with some of his friends. I think he was just coming from a performance. And then he said to me, hello. And I said, hello. What are you doing here? I said, I've come to look for, I mentioned the person's name. And he said, oh, did you find him? I said, no. I said, where are you going? I was a bit taken aback. I've never met this man. How come he's questioning me? And then he said, I would like to see you again. I just ignored him and he said, I'm going to marry you. I just, well, I said, well, in my mind, I just laughed. I said, he's a theater person, so I'm not bothered. And I said, oh yeah, thank you. And I left. That was our first encounter. And I kept praying in my mind, what kind of person is this? You are seeing somebody for the first time, you don't know the person, and I say, I am going to marry you. Hey, boys, you know, I doubted if I could win her hand in marriage at the beginning because she was finishing at the university and if I allowed her to leave that year for any other part of the world, I probably would have lost her. I thank God that I was not misled by what I heard people saying about him then. And I don't call him my husband, I call him my friend. He's the only confidant that I've got. I have never looked back one single day to say, why did I marry this man? A man like him is very, very rare to come by as a friend, as a father, as a human being, because what you see in Tsunji is what you get. I'm happy that I am married to a woman who has supported me in my life for 41 years now. And she's given back to very good children, and they've done very well. And she herself has been very enterprising and very, very supportive of my arts. We didn't plan to stay in this country. I came for a holiday, and by sheer coincidence, he was in Leeds, so we were going from Leeds, we'll come to London, we'll go and see him. And when he was eventually recognized and they wanted to kill him, I was five months pregnant then, and he said to me, Kike, I am going home. 
The prison is not meant for goats. All they would do is put me in prison. And then at the end of the day, we will know we are fighting for my kids and for you to have a better Nigeria. Some very God-fearing people called in them. You have been recognized. Don't try and come to Nigeria. And that's how I got out of Britain when my wife was five months pregnant. I was sent out here, she was pregnant. And I went around the world because I had to move. Each time my visa was about to expire, I had to move from one country to another. So I went almost around the world. She was not here when I had the baby. The baby was eight months old. Before that means for over a year, we did not see, we only communicate on the phone. It was hard, but thank God, the baby is now in her final year at the university. Can you imagine that? So, this place, Ma'am Salam has given me some benefits. And uh, we have settled here for so many years now. We, the Ubers, we, we talk very much about our culture. We are very proud of it. But what do we do to sustain the people who produce this culture? We don't do anything. You know, how can you know, they, you know, somebody like Tudi should, you know, should, should be here, you know, should, should be here as an icon, you know, celebrated and giving example to those coming, you know, at that time. But all over, you look at it, it's not just Tudi, you know. I mean, you know, look at Akiru Mishola before he died, uh, Faliti, what did he do for them? And yet we say culture, culture is this, but we, we have nothing, no national thing to help these people. We should care for them. We should. How can, you know, it's intolerable, I mean, that, that somebody like Toby has to live in Asia and probably going to die there. You know. We are not careful. I mean, I, I'm really uh, I'm happy about this. <laughs> My dad and I were very close. He often calls me Iyai Bengi and I call him my Junji. That's because I look just like his mom and since I was little he's called me mommy. Um, one of the biggest lessons I learned from my dad was that there is nothing I can't achieve. If I ever spoke to him about an aspiration or something I wanted to do, he never told me it was too big or too difficult. And whenever I made mistakes, he would tell me it was either the examiner's fault or somebody else's fault, but that I was greater than that. And that's really given me the confidence that I have today to, to excel and, and aim for things higher than um, what most people would at times. He's also very funny. You know, we spend a lot of time laughing. He makes fun of me often, and I make fun of him too. My favourite or earliest memory about my dad is when he used to take me to his shows and um, I would, he'd sit me at the back of the stage and when he's performing, he'll come and ask me what song should I play and I really liked it when he played Agbalode even though I was too small to understand it to see how people reacted when that song came on it was amazing, as a child to see Yawa Agbalagba jump like that, make noise, was something for it left a permanent impression on me as a child. So he's a truly devoted father and he has dedicated his life to looking after me and the entire family. My earliest memories are of him taking me to school, washing me, feeding me, doing everything in his capability to make sure that I had the best childhood possible. I remember he used to sing nursery rhymes together and here's the reason that I have such a knack for music. He's wise. He's a good human being. He has a good heart. And yes, he's very witty because he calls me Gorimakba or Fumanchu. <laughs> but there's one specific trait that endears me a lot to him. It's his sense of family. And you can all see that at home and also at Ebuke. And this is something that inspires me that I hope to emulate as well. Tunji has been very careless with his health. He would play at This Is Night Club all night, standing. Ah, Abba. 
no wonder he began to have problems with his uh, legs and his in his back. Uh, even those of us who don't uh, you know undergo that kind of uh, self torture, we know that the back is the most uh, sensitive. So I would like to wish him a greater and more careful concern for his health. Creativity comes naturally to Tunji. I don't need to wish him anything on that score. No, yeah, that's there. And it's going to be with him until he joins us on the other side. No question. Which, oh yeah, that's another wish. He should take his time and not be in a hurry, even when those of us who are older have already gone. A long life. I love you, God bless you, happy birthday. And I look forward to being your daughter for the next 30 years, having you carry my children, Roya's children, of course children. The man is a permanent pillar in my life. I can never change. I will never change who this man is. I will never ask for another father. I just wanted to thank him and wish him a very happy birthday and long life and prosperity. So daddy, this is me wishing you happy birthday and many more to come. I love him with my heart, with my whole heart. If it is possible, if there's reincarnation, if they give back to me, and I look around and I cannot recognize Tunji, I would rather die and go back. Because I pray if I come back a million times, I want to be married to Tunji again. <laughs> I want to be a little more better.